My son is Aviatar. He's uh, four and a half years old. I'm not objective <laughs> to say that, but he's a perfect little boy. And he's smart, and he's funny, and he's curious. <laughs> Last year, he started to behave a little bit strange to us. He rode on his bicycle and he was in front of me. And I see he's stopping. He's looking at me with terrified eyes and say, Mommy? And I saw something strange with his eyes. And I said, Aviatar. And then I saw it again. And at the hospital, they did a lot of tests, and they told us that Avitar have epilepsy. <sighs> Avitar got worse every day. Now we have like 15 big seizures per day. He's losing his conscience and just falling. That's why he's with the helmet. He can die from one seizure or from his condition. And it's really, really scary. Which life is it like this? What is it? It's, it's not fair. And we start to, to consult, OK, what's the best we can do for him? And then the idea of maybe to fly to some place in the world that have a professional in pediatric epilepsy, maybe it's the best for him. And he is the most important things in our lives. So we ask this question, OK, so where? Well, this is what we live for. Our ethical framework is actually pretty simple and easy to understand. The Cleveland Clinic has over 10,000 of the Cleveland. Everything that we do, we strive to look at through patient's eyes. We're trying to reduce suffering in healthcare. That's what motivates us. It's our sense of purpose here. At the Cleveland Clinic, our mission has not really changed from the very inception of Cleveland Clinic. So we're about to turn 100 years old, and our mission is about to turn 100 years old. We have a worldwide reputation. The celebration of the past 100 years should be focused on how we've stayed true to who we are. Echo is off and running from the Cleveland Clinic. It's our culture. The culture of teamwork commitment to excellence. They are. The Cleveland Clinic was the home of the medicine. This organization is our home. And the motto, Patients First, is here to stay. OK, babe. I'm going to take the blood sugar. A lot of health is determined before you ever enter the healthcare system. The current life expectancy of an African-American male is that of a white male 30 years ago. The healthcare system, we are failing within the African-American community to improve this basic metric. Who is this, your mom? How old was she on there? This looks like something she wore to our wedding. I was a correction officer in Cleveland downtown jail for 24 years. I don't miss that job. Come home every day, eat, go to sleep, get up the next day, go to work, you know, and train your body that way. I train my body that way. <laughs> hey, Mr. Philmon. How are you? Carl is a perfect example of the potential hazards of being diabetic. He had a small cut on his, on his foot. That went on to become a very severe infection. And as this process of non-healing persisted, we started to investigate his peripheral circulation. So you can see up here, this is in your thigh area, and your amputation site is totally blocked here. We don't see that blood vessel. We're gonna look at your wound, and we're gonna apply a special uh, skin graft today. 
Okay. People oftentimes think about the United States as a country that has this dichotomy in the perceptions of healthcare. On one side, we have a really exceptional hospital care, and on the other side, uh, some of our public health outcomes are certainly not as good as one would expect for a, such a developed country as the United States. The reasons behind it is that the social determinants of health are the most powerful determinants of public health in a nation. Those who are poor, those who are less educated are those who suffer most. All right, so we'll get this skin graph prepared for you. I do believe that population health helps to equalize the care that our patients get and it will help to decrease disparity. And so when we're providing equal opportunities for treatment to all populations, everybody rises and everybody stays healthy. I feel pretty good about that this Mr. Philmon, I have very good success with this human amnion. With the understanding of an importance of social determinants of health comes also the understanding of the responsibility and the role that large organizations like ours play. It's a start, I thought that it's okay. Many people who have epilepsy and I'm sure we're gonna, it's gonna be okay. But after I saw him seizuring every day, we see that the medicine is not, not working. Uh, the doctor started to talk with us on uh, the options of surgery. First, I thought that surgery is not a word that I want to hear. I don't know anyone to touch my young boy, my perfect young boy. After we found out that it's going to be more complicated, we thought, stop, let's come to the best place in the world. Whoa! How many superheroes? <laughs> we told him uh, we're going to fly to, to, to another place and we are going to meet the best doctor in the world. <laughs> and he was so excited because he really wants someone to help him. He may be little, just four and a half years old, but he understands everything. Okay. You know, we're very exciting. But, you know, as a father, we're very afraid. It's going to be all right. Huh? Hold your breath, and again, don't move when that raises. My name is Terry Monique Overton. I've turned 40 July 10th. Okay you know, I've always wanted to get a mammogram done due to the fact of my mom, it ran in our family on her side. And then we'll do that same picture on this side. Obviously, our foremost responsibility is to provide health care. But there are other responsibilities to provide support, education, in particular around the topics that are relevant to health care. And lastly, and very, very importantly, to provide jobs. Hi. My name is Shannon Ross. I am a patient navigator in Cleveland Clinic. What makes my work meaningful is that I'm able to help the people that live in the same community as me and I'm able to give them resources. I'm able to speak to their fears, and I'm able to help them through such a system that most people might be intimidated by, you know, a big hospital um, that they don't know where to start. Hi, welcome to Langston. What's your appointment for today? Mammogram screening. Okay, let me call upstairs and let them know you're here. Hi, Shannon. Your patient is here for her. First mammogram. encounter with Terry um, over the phone, she was actually one of the patients that we, we find in our database. Hi, Ms. Terry, how are you today? I'm doing pretty good in yourself. She's at the age of 40, never had a mammogram. Um, so my supervisor sent her information to me and asked me to reach out to her. The Cleveland Clinic is an oasis. It really sits in the middle of a lot of under-resourced areas. And anything that's shiny and bright might bring fear. I literally had a resident say, that building looks too nice. It looks like some of those buildings at Cleveland Clinic. 
And I'm thinking, it's too nice. So we have to be inviting. We have to have smiles to show that they are a part of our family. One of our doctors said to me the other day, we can't treat who we do not know. So that's what we're trying to do. And we're trying to get them to also know themselves. Hi. Hi, how are hey. you? Good. Uh, it's Dr. Abraham. This is your first mammogram, right? Yes. Right, OK. And tell me, do you have any family history? Of yes, I do. Our family health centers that are in our immediate communities serve multiple purposes. One of them is early cancer detection through cancer screening. And it is really important to understand that those centers are part of our integrated healthcare delivery system, such as Cleveland Clinic, meaning that if the patients were to have an early stage cancer that we're able to detect on time, then we can start an immediate treatment here in our main campus or one of our hospitals. And uh, that is really an advantage of having a large healthcare system in an immediate neighborhood that we can provide an entire scope of treatment from early detection to cure. So I have the results. The, the radiologist didn't see anything to say for sure. I don't think there's anything we need to worry. Um, you know, we need to have an ultrasound. Um, we will do that tomorrow. And actually, Shannon will take care of that. Once a person get a diagnosis of cancer, their whole life changes. It evokes so many emotions. And when I wear this white coat, I take it really seriously. And so I think last time I saw you, we were going to get a bone density study in December. Yes. That's what I had in my notes. So I feel a strong kinship with priests. I have a number of patients who are priests, and I feel like they're in a similar position, which is life is unfair and bad things happen to good people, and we're witness to that. Hello, hello. I think one question that all of us in yeah. medicine have to ask ourselves is why should the patient trust me? And I worry that we think that just because there's an MD or a DO after our name, that means we're entitled to the patient's trust. So your PSA is fine, so I don't have any, yeah. any, any difficult news today. <sighs> yeah, I know, it's a, it's a hard week yeah. before we test it. Yeah, that is. So it's four years now, right? It's four years now. Four years. How are you doing in terms of side effects at this point? Being a doctor isn't just about knowledge and isn't about just knowing the right diagnosis. It's about caring for people as human beings. You can't just say these words. Everybody says this stuff, but you've actually got to act on it. You've actually got to put things in place that are going to make things better for patients. Well, that's the big question, isn't it? How do we teach empathy? So now we're going to try a skills practice. So Dave, you're going to be playing our doctor. And Brenna, you'll be paying the patient. We're practicing giving bad news. So how do you think she might react? Uh, she might be really sad. She might. Over 10 years ago, the clinic started looking seriously at how we communicate with patients. We started with the idea that most clinicians, in fact, most people think they're amazing communicators. And if you think you're amazing at something, the likelihood that you're going to sign up for a class is pretty low. The people we were training we're very good at understanding how to figure out the right treatment and the right diagnosis and all of that. But oftentimes, the conversations I heard them having with patients seem to lack an understanding of what it would be like to be the patient in that conversation. And if she's sad or angry, what, what are you going to... I can tell her that it's normal to feel these things when you get news like this. Right, right. Because otherwise, the patient can feel lost. And where do we go from here? So shall we d dive in and give it a try? Yeah. Knock, knock. Can I come in? Yeah. Hi, Mrs. Klein. The How clinic decided today? that that was going to be a priority and developed a training program for all of our physicians in how to conduct conversations with patients that were built more around a strong relationship with the patients. I think she's, now she's wanting information. Right. So that's sort of a turning point in the conversation. But then she kind of got there on her own. Like she was These are some examples of moving empathy out of a one-on-one -on -one relationship and into the way an organization runs. There's a quote on the wall in one of our hallways from one of our founding fathers that says, the patient is the most important person in the institution. It's our job to satisfy them. That's where we started 100 years ago. And we're still there, driving that same patient-centered promise. 
Nearly 100 years ago, the clinic was founded by a number of men who were in the military who recognized that they could provide the best care for the patient when they worked together as a team. These gentlemen, Dr. Kreil, Dr. Lauer, Dr. Bunce, Dr. Phillips, there are four people, our founders, that considered themselves equal. But what they put together in this base hospital was what Cleveland Clinic is today. It's a patient-focused, integrated, multi-specialty, interdependent system. It was a whole team. There are enduring values in the early days of the Cleveland Clinic that I believe endure absolutely to this day. The wisdom on our founding fathers was uh, inspirational. To put together the organization that essentially has not questioned the fundamental concepts of our construct uh, in a hundred years of service to the patients, to the communities, to our fellow, fellow caregivers is nothing short of exceptional and remarkable. As the war ended, they said, you know, this is the way to go. This is what we want to do. Surgeons and internists, anesthetists, x-ray and research. And one more thing, he said, we're going to send our best. Our epilepsy center has been a pioneer in developing new methods for seizure localization and then developing the surgeries that allow us to take out the problem without harming the brain around it. Before we met Dr. Wiley, we read about her a lot. Dr. Elaine Wiley is a pioneer of epilepsy in the United States, in the world. Elaine is a hero for all children with epilepsy. Amazing woman. She had the courage to aggressively treat kids with seizure problems that were thought to be incurable. We have a seizure. This is a seizure. A life with epilepsy can be very hard, and we're weighing that against the opportunities of stopping the seizures with surgery. And when we think of it that way, the opportunity to innovate can be a chance for a better life. So the cortex, which is the layer of all the Astute doctors in Israel recognized that there were some clues to the way his seizures behaved, suggesting that surgery might be a possibility. In Israel, we have a great doctor, but Israel is a small country. And I think what's so unique here, they're working as a real team. Good morning. Good morning. Mom, how are you? How about Aviator? How is he? I see cases every day from all over the world where patients are told you don't have any options, and you look at the pictures and you say, gosh, I mean, there is an option and we should do something. Dr. Bingaman is probably the most experienced epilepsy surgeon in North America. I happen to work right here in Cleveland with him, but if my child needed epilepsy surgery, I'd be happy to take an airplane so that he could do it. My interest in hemispherectomy, coupled with Dr. Wiley's zest to treat pediatric epilepsy, really led, I think, to uh, the world's largest experience in hemispheric epilepsy. And then once we had applied this experience, we knew this could be done safely and effectively. <laughs> My uh, personal philosophy is the parents are always right. Making the decision as a parent to have part of your child's brain removed because they can't make that decision, you're making it for them. There's a lot of, I think, uh, emotions in that decision. To travel from Israel to the United States in the middle of the pandemic, it's clear that they would do anything for their child. Um, let me get a marking pen, I'll be right back. If we can cure him and to help him with his situation, uh, of course we will. Of course, we will try. OK, once we get socks and shoes off here and get the boot off, um, there's two tests that we're going to okay. do. Compare the pressure uh, increasing the rates of diabetes uh, over really the last 50 years, the trajectory has just been upward. And that's multifactorial, somewhat controversial. Clearly, obesity is increasing. Carl recognizes the impact that an amputation would have on his life. 
He's lived with it for two years. You know, I'm a, a guy with good character. I feel like I'm in good hands with Cleveland Clinic. You should stick with that if somebody's going to help you, right? A lot of what we do in treating blood vessels is based upon all these imaging studies. And what I can see is this, see that bright white area? That's calcium within your artery. Vascular surgery is kind of looked at amongst the surgical specialties as a very detail-oriented um, area of surgery. You know, it's meticulous and how we sew blood, blood vessels. The With the uh, assistance of these procedures, we can improve the circulation to his foot, really give him the full court press with an attempt to save his limb. Have a good day, Mr. Philmon. All right, thank you. We live in a free market. Healthcare follows reimbursement and, and payment. And for so long, that has been a fee-for-service model. Good morning, how are you? Okay. We're gonna do a huddle where we discuss the plan of care. It's kind of like a football huddle. If you compensate someone to produce widgets wildly, they will produce a lot of widgets. If you compensate someone to just do what's right for the patient in this instance, I don't get extra money if I do five extra procedures. My compensation doesn't change. All of a sudden, that opens up the ability and the interest of physicians to collaborate. You might be in another market and go and visit a specialist for this, only to have to pack up your records and see a specialist for something that might be very complimentary. But here, we work together as a team and we collaborate on helping patients heal. 14 years ago, we reorganized ourselves around the needs of the patient. All the professionals that participate, regardless on how they trained, revolve around the disease and the patient that they are treating. For instance, I'm a vascular surgeon. I may need my cardiology colleagues or my cardiovascular colleagues, infectious disease, to take care of a patient. I'm not incentivized to try to do something that may be on the margins of my expertise. And the Cleveland Clinic really attracts a physician that is interested in team-based care. We're here to help each other. We're here to help each other help the patient. We are an academic medical center, but we're not hidebound like many of the traditional academic medical centers are. Adult epilepsy, pediatric epilepsy, neurosurgery, psychology, bringing all of these specialists together that's where we get our opportunities to help in situations that are not immediately apparent. It is a new way to deliver care. Yeah. It is a culture of respect and for passion for patient care. And this permeates every corner of this organization. You can feel it when you walk around here. It's very common to get called back on your first mammogram because we don't know what your breast tissue looks like. Okay, so if they So I think, you know, when you go into oncology, a lot of those of us who are drawn into it are drawn because of our deep concern for people and wanting to connect with them. I'm gonna cover you up here. Hi, Terry, how are you? Okay. I'm gonna take a look at a couple areas that we see. I'm I feel like our specialty is difficult conversations. I think people don't understand how hard the conversations are. Some of the focal areas seem to be um, some overlapping tissue or less prominent once we do compression. Others of them we can see are really truly You there. know, it's kind of really scary, you know. I might have it. I might have it. I might have it. A little bigger than the yeah, tissue as well. I've been scared <laughs> to get it, but I know what's best for me. So I just have one more to find, and then we should be done. I'm closing my eyes. <laughs> And all I want to see is like two months from now, 
a Vietars riding on his bike and just with no danger, no seizures, nothing. Okay, we're Aviatar's team, okay? Every day, the seizures are becoming more stronger. We don't want to wait even one more day. Do you have a favorite PJ mask? Oh. People that go into neurosciences tend to be optimists. On one hand, you have patients with extraordinary needs. There's nothing in the toolbox that currently can address that problem. So we need to innovate. On the other hand, in everything that we do that's experimental, it carries a risk. Okay. Can I just verify your name and your birthday with me? Carl Filming. The surgery we're planning to perform on Carl, essentially, we're opening up blood vessels using a combination of balloons or stents, which are metal scaffolds. We push the blood vessel open, but that restores blood flow to the foot in this instance. So they're oxygenating him, then they're gonna put the... And we told him, the doctor, the best doctor in the world, is going to come and take all the seizures out. After he will enter to the surgery, the only thing that we can do is to pray. We did all the things we can do. Carl, we're gonna give you some numbing medication so you're gonna feel a bee sting, okay? One, two, three. For a patient like Carl that's gone through this for two years, he has modified his behavior and done all that we've asked of him. That's why I'm pulling for him to get through this and for us to have a successful outcome. That looks good, his runoff looks good down to that uh, foot. These patients, you know, some of them have seizures the next day. And so I think that's the hardest part for the parents is, is hearing that, well, gosh, remember, I don't know for sure it's gonna stop. So they're oxygenating him, then they're gonna put the, the breathing tube in the electric side of there. He really understands everything that's going on, but he really, really wants someone to help him, and that's why we're here. It's going to happen. And maybe we are going to cure our little boy. Hi, Simone, Dr. Kirk Sim, looking for the family of Mr. Philmon. There is an expectation for organizations like Cleveland Clinic to set the tone for the country, for the world. Can you hear me? Yes, I hear you. So we just did Mr. Philmon's angiogram, and he actually uh -huh. has fantastic circulation, so that's, that's great. All that the, is great. All of us are happy with the way that it looks today. We so, do have a healthy understanding that uh, this is a never-ending task, but we also uh, have this ethical imperative to grow. We are global and therefore our research has to support people around the world. We have always uh, served international patients from the, the very beginning. You can dive into the documents from our inception. And when I came to the clinic in around 2005, we were beginning to evolve our thinking around recreating the model in another location in the globe. And with fantastic partners, we've been able to create something that no other healthcare system in the United States has been able to create. And that is? That's Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. Well, it took an entire team trying to set up an international employee population. Over 360 beds in a bespoke building on a man-made island you know, halfway around the world from us, but connected to us digitally. Isn't it shocking to see the brain waves of someone in another country being watched live across the globe? Las Vegas, Cleveland, Canada. As well as in Florida, London, Cleveland Clinic Abu Dhabi. I find it remarkable. I think there's a passion for excellence at this organization, but there's vast, vast opportunities in many corners of the globe that we haven't touched and we're looking for how they either would interact independently or they would interact collectively with what we've delivered in London and what we've delivered in Abu Dhabi. 
We believe that we can make a difference and through that we believe that we have a responsibility to share that with, uh, with the world. Each of those uh, facilities where the Cleveland Clinic plants its seed and hospitals and healthcare grow, research grows right along with it. From the very founding in February 1921, research, education, and patient care. It's all mixed together. And research is part of what we do. It's part of the delivery of care. And so we have a massive portfolio of clinical trials and we can't do research without philanthropy. Funding from, from governmental agencies is, is not what it once was, and we rely in, to a very large degree on philanthropy to offer the latest and best new therapies for patients. We do get grants. We're very successful at it. But when we have an idea, we want to move it forward right away. We are proud of the care that we provide today. We think it's second to none and yet we're not satisfied with it. We want to always make that care better by investing in the treatments of tomorrow. Excellence in clinical care and research helps us to educate those who are going to come after us and we're going to lead, lead the medicine into, into the future. Surgery went very well. He's going to go to the pe pediatric ICU. Uh, I opened things up, everything went fine. He didn't need any blood. So we took it out, I sent it to the pathologist. They'll give us a report. And at the end, the EEG was nice and quiet. Now, as we talked about, I don't know that the seizures will go. The only proof is time, okay? But remember, when you leave here, the work starts. Yeah. Patients I see as a surgeon, have all failed medicines. They expect to fail. Everything that they've done so far has failed. Uh, and so when you cure them and the epilepsy goes away and they can drive and they can work, they're the happiest, most grateful people uh, in the world. And that, that's very gratifying. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank you for everything. I've had the opportunity to care for thousands of children with epilepsy in my career and each one has left a mark on me. Good morning, may I come in? Hello, hello. Eviatar, would you like to open something? Everything seems to be going really well. I have heard nothing um, about any problems. Would you agree? <laughs> he looks like a wizard. Neuroscience is a humbling field of medicine. Many of the things we treat are incurable. And to be able to come to a cure, we will have to collaborate between physicians and scientists so that scientists can better understand the limits of medicine and physicians can better understand what science can offer for progress. Uh, I don't separate patient care and research. To me, they are integrated parts of what we are at Cleveland Clinic. No, I'm okay. okay. All right, yep, we'll give them about just a couple more minutes. Yeah. Trying to be pretty strong. And it hurts, <laughs> but I understand. <laughs> I've learned a lot of things this past week. You know, I'm stronger than I thought I was. <laughs> well, I'll be here with you. <laughs> And we're going to get you. some good news. Yep. So whatever the results are, I'm willing to accept them. We know who is receiving this news from me. We know the family, we know the kids. Uh, the toughest part is when I walk into the room and tell them. Uh, what's the best way to get that information across to someone? Like you're just about to shatter their world. and. It's hard to overestimate the magnitude of some of these conversations. 
um, I'm so glad you came back and we did you know, all these extra tests. So it's showing the cyst and it's normal. It's, you know, we do see that you know, it's not unusual for us to see that. Now, if somebody has a cyst, is that a high risk condition for breast cancer? No, cyst will not increase the risk for breast cancer. Mm -hmm. um, so it's all great news and you know, it's really, really good news, yeah. And I think what is sad for me sometimes is that patients don't realize how much we in medicine care about them, but the reason they don't know it is that we don't show it to them. And empathy in a lot of ways is about trying to show patients how much we care. With your family history, I think it's good for uh, us to follow it closely. And then the medical breast team will you know, see you and they'll, they'll keep an eye on that. And you will come back? Absolutely. I know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you have all these new friends now, right? Absolutely. <laughs>